So we've been talking about fear and um, the fact that God wants us to overcome the fears in our life. He never wants us to surrender to fear. And I was looking at some of the most common fears that are out there, and uh, here are a few of them you'd recognize. One is arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. Uh, here's another, the fear of snakes. I mean, even Indiana Jones is afraid of snakes. Um, common one, the fear of heights. Here's one, the fear of germs. I'll tell you what, talk about fears paralyzing your life. That's why you want to overcome them. This kind of fear can paralyze your life. The fear of flying. And if you ever are on an airplane and a person next to you has white knuckles grabbing the seat, you know that this is a fear that they have. Um, not just the fear of going down. Now from this new uh, show out, uh, Manifest, you have to worry about that you might be landing five years later after you take <laughs> off. Um, here's a common fear, claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. Uh, this one you may not seem as common, the fear of chickens. <laughs> fear of chickens. And sometimes these go in pairs. If You could be afraid of being in an enclosed space with chickens, and that could be quite unsettling. Um, the fear of clowns. Oh, some of you have experienced that. Not all fears are logical. The fear of zombies. <laughs> but you know, all of these in one way or another tie to what has been often called the greatest fear and that is the fear of death. And today we're gonna to be talking about the fear of death and the antidote to the fear of death. Um, we read these words from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. If you have fear in your life, know this for sure, God did not give it to you. It's not a gift from God. Uh, he gives us power, love, and a sound mind. And so we've seen that we can overcome our fears, that the word of God will vanquish our fears, the promises of God will vanquish our fears, the name of Jesus will vanquish our fears. And today we're gonna to talk about that ultimate fear, the fear of death, but the fact that it'll be vanquished as well, that the reality of heaven vanquishes the fear of death. The reality of heaven vanquishes the fear of death. And so we're going to just take a look, starting in Ecclesiastes, verse 3. We read these words. He, this is God, has planted eternity in the human heart. You know, according to a Gallup poll recently, over 80% of Americans believe that there is life after life on earth, that we have an eternal soul that lives on forever, either, either in God's presence or outside of God's presence, but there is eternity, that life here on this earth isn't the end. Well, that's kind of striking because there's not nearly 80% of people who would call themselves Christians or even spiritual. So how could this be? Will God build it into us? This knowledge that these years that we live on this earth is just a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. That our destiny is far beyond what happens here on this earth. And rather than fearing what will happen after death, Jesus taught his followers that they should look forward to what is going to happen after we die. In fact, here's something that Jesus made very clear, that heaven is our destination, not just a backup plan. And I think sometimes we, when we think about heaven or talk about heaven, we think of it as a backup plan and we say, you know what, you know, let's go to the doctor, let's get this healed, and you know what, God's gonna heal you, you're gonna be okay, we're gonna get past this. But just in case, there's always heaven. Just in case, there's always heaven. I know you're in this dangerous situation. I know it's going to be, you, you never know, and, and we're going to pray for safety, and God's going to bring you through. But, but just in case, there's always heaven. As if heaven somehow is a second best option. It's like a backup, oh, when plan A didn't work, so plan B is heaven. Well, you know what? I miss my mom, I miss my dad. I miss Linda's dad, but not because they're in plan B. I, I, I don't, I, I, I miss them, but it's not that somehow they're, since they're in heaven, that they are living out something less than if they had many, many more years on this earth. No, heaven is our destination. Heaven is where we are ultimately designed to go. And if you've lost a loved one, 
don't think that somehow they're in plan B, that there's some backup plan that they kicked into. No, they're in plan A. They're in heaven. They're in their ultimate destination. I mean, read how, read, read what Paul wrote to the Philippians about it. In Philippians 3, verse 20, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. No, wait a second, Paul. You're a citizen of Rome. You're a citizen of Judea. No, I'm a citizen of heaven. This may be where I'm living for a few years, but this is, this is where I belong. This is my ultimate place. This is, this is where I'm going. Listen what he wrote a little bit earlier in that same letter. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. What's Paul saying? Is I'm going to stay on earth as long as I can, for your sake, I want to make a difference in the world. But when it comes to what's better, oh, it's better for me to be in heaven. Let me ask you a question. Does it sound like Paul has the fear of death? Absolutely not. You know why? Because he understood the reality of heaven. The reality of heaven will always vanquish the fear of death for you or for others. And so what's this destination look like, this heaven? that Paul was so much looking forward to, that we can so much look forward to. Well, remember when Jesus was on the cross, he said to the thief next to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. So we know for sure that heaven is a paradise. Um, for me, the closest thing that I would call paradise on earth is Hawaii. I mean, I've been, I love Hawaii. If I'm watching Hawaii Five-0 or Magnum PI or House Hunters Hawaii, I always think I wanna go back there. That was paradise. Well, let's say this. To me, and I don't know what your paradise is, but whatever it is, that's the baseline. Heaven's better. Whatever you think is paradise on earth, heaven is going to be better. It's better dramatically just because of what will not be there. That is in Hawaii and everywhere else on this earth. Um, look in Revelation 21 verse 4, talking about the return of Christ. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Um, so in heaven, there are no tears. There's no tears, no sorrow, no depression, no insecurities, no stress, no sadness, no grief, no anxiety. That's all absent in heaven. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There is no pain. You never have to again, again worry about your cholesterol level. You, you never have to worry about, you know, uh, all the different things that you're worried about every time you go to the doctor, your blood pressure. Never again do you have to experience sickness or never again will you watch someone you love experience sickness. It's gone. It's vanquished from heaven. There will be no death. You'll never go to another viewing. You'll never go to another funeral once you're in heaven. It's, it's that, that's, something, that's an earthly thing. That's not a heavenly thing. You won't be irritated by people in heaven. Even people you don't expect to be there. Um, <laughs> believe me, you'll be up there and you'll walk up to a person and say, what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> and they'll be saying, I was about to ask you the same question. Um, but, they, but the reason that you're, irrit you're irritated with them, you won't be irritated in heaven. In fact, turn to the person next to you and just say, you won't irritate me in heaven. <laughs> and then over lunch, maybe you can talk about how to reduce the irritation here on earth. And, uh, but that, that's, that's, that'll be another series. Um, but heaven's going to be paradise, even if you just described it in terms of what it won't be. But Jesus talked about it in far greater ways than just what it won't be. Also what it will be. Look, look at what he said to his followers in John 14, verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And you may have read in other translations, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What's Jesus saying? Heaven's going to be awesome. Now, I was in a church service one time, and it was on and on. It was, it was deadly. It was very boring. Um, like boring to the point of people slipping into a coma during this endless message. And then this is what happened. The pastor, who is annoyed by people nodding off, said, if you don't like church, you won't like heaven. Because heaven is like one long church service. <laughs> and I thought, man, if this is heaven, <laughs> if, the, if, 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 if this church is like heaven, I, this is bad. That's bad news. This is really bad news. Um, but who says church is one, that, that heaven is one long church service? The Bible doesn't teach that. It's not even going to be as awesome as, it's going to be more awesome than even Amplify Church, much less, much as some long, boring. You know, the, I used to have this image of heaven that we would get into heaven and we would just be floating on clouds and some of us would have hymn books and others would have harps and that that's what heaven was for eternity. Just now hymn 421, you know. Heaven's not more boring than earth. I'm telling you. It's literally impossible. Jesus said, hey, I just want you to know, I'm not, I'm not taking you up to put you on know, fluffy clouds. I got, I got dwelling places for you. I've got mansions for you. Wait till you get to heaven. It will be unreal. And what Jesus was painting was a very different picture than some giant choir loft where we're all just singing for the rest of eternity. I don't believe that's what heaven is about. And so I'm gonna speculate a little bit from what I understand. It's an educated guess. Some things I'm sure I'm wrong about. Some things I don't think I'll be wrong about. But first, what about our bodies? What are our bodies be like in heaven? Well, Jesus still had his body after he died and rose from the dead. And people knew who he was. And so he still had a body. He spoke with people. He listened to people. He ate with people. And we're going to have our bodies, we'll still have our bodies in heaven. Hopefully, for some of your sakes, they'll be slightly tweaked. But nevertheless, we're still going to have all of our sakes. <laughs> um, no, and, and we'll recognize each other. I mean, people knew it was Jesus. He was Jesus. He was different than what he, they knew him, but he, they still knew it was Jesus. They're not going to, you're not going to walk up to me in heaven and say, George Clooney. No. <laughs> It'll be, no, Lee Kreitzer, you know. It's, you'll, I'll know you, you'll know me. So we retain our identity. Um, Jesus interacted with others, he spoke with them, he ate food. Uh, you know, for, since the beginning of time, people have enjoyed meals with each other that they love, people they love, and you have laughter. I think that's going to happen in heaven, and not just the great marriage supper of the Lamb. And so, uh, why wouldn't we enjoy that amazing part of life. You'll be able to eat, speak, hear, laugh. One person asked me, will there be sex in heaven? It's a good question because I know in one religion, the ultimate reward a man could get is 72 women just for himself or 72 virgins. So obviously they think there's going to be sex in heaven. That's not the Christian tradition. The Christian tradition is that we're at a, a different level where the kind of sexual drives and desires that have caused so much grief on earth won't be a part of heaven, and I believe that that is true. Um, by the way, I read the ultimate reward a woman could get in heaven is 72 men, all sitting attentively and listening to her talk. <laughs> no. no, I take that back. If I take that back, I apologize for that. Um, so besides our bodies, what's heaven going to be like? Well, think about this. Did God make man in his image? No. It, it wouldn't be shocking that God made the earth in heaven's image. Some actually believe that heaven is a giant planet or some galaxies of planets. Um, but will there be water in heaven? Yeah. There, I think the rivers, the streams, the mountains, the forests, but they'll just far exceed anything that we've experienced here on this earth. The beaches, the coral reefs, they'll surpass everything. Heaven is described in terms of a city. Well, there have to be some place where our mansions and our dwelling places go. 
Well, we look at, I mean, I love the city of Pittsburgh. I love living in Atlanta. I've loved visiting places like New York and Sydney and London. But the, if you're impressed by any cities that men have made, imagine the cities of God. I mean, the cities of heaven will far surpass anything that humans could have come up with. Will there be music in heaven? Of course there'll be music in heaven. What style? Well, will just be harps and orchestra? There'll, probably there'll be harps and orchestra up there. Classic rock? I'm certain there'll be classic rock uh, <laughs> sound up there. Um, country or bluegrass? <laughs> Can't say. Um, but do you think that the music in heaven will be, have less variety or be more boring than the music of earth? No, there is no way. Maybe it'll be in the miracle of hearing. Maybe we'll all be worshiping before the throne, and some of you would be, by your preference, hearing a pipe organ being played. Others will be at the Bill Gaither homecoming um, get together with people singing, and others will be listening to Amplify Worship, you know, whatever it might be. I, I think the music in heaven will be real, but it'll blow our minds. It'll be so far beyond anything that we could think. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm sure in heaven there'll be animals and birds and wildlife. We know the lion will lay next to the lamb. And so people always ask me if there'll be dogs in heaven. Well, God created dogs, right? So why would they not be in heaven? Some people even think God created cats. Um, <laughs> but will, will there be animals in heaven? Yeah, there'll be animals in heaven. Here's something that you may not like to hear. I believe there will, there will be jobs in heaven, that we will have work in heaven. When God created Adam and Eve, he didn't say, okay, you woke up this morning. Now, for your entire day, we've got two hammocks over here between these trees. Just lay down and relax till it's ready for bedtime. No. No, they, they worked. But, you see, the work that we would do in heaven has been... Uh, yeah, all, all the pain, all of the negative parts of work will have been taken out of it. But is there a reward for making a difference and doing something? Absolutely. I think we'll have amazing work in heaven. I think this, this is pure conjecture, but I think we're going to be able to travel in heaven. I love traveling in earth. And traveling in heaven, um, it, it, could you imagine? I mean, when Jesus would uh, disappear in one moment and appear someplace totally different in his glorified body. And so it would be like you've got a Star Trek transponder and you're able to go from one place to another. And imagine the galaxies that you could explore and how absolutely stunning that would be as part of being in heaven. The bottom line is this. In the beginning, God created this earth and he looked at it and he said, it's very, very good. It is absurd to think that God would make heaven less interesting than earth. It's absurd to think that heaven would be in any way less interesting or less fascinating than earth. To think about the most wonderful things you've experienced on this planet and then multiply that exponentially because that's the kind of thing that we will experience in heaven. Here's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. No eye has seen no ear has heard. No mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So it's even beyond our imagination. So no matter how high your expectations are of heaven, the reality of heaven will far, far exceed your expectations. And for that reason, the reality of heaven, when you start to get a hold of the reality of heaven, it will definitely vanquish the fear of death. It'll check that one right off of whatever list of fears you're fighting. You say, okay, well, if that's on the other side, that's at least one thing I don't have to be afraid of because of the reality of heaven. Ultimately, heaven is heaven because of God's presence. That is, that's the distinguishing feature, not the mountains, not the planets, not the places that we get to live. There's nothing about heaven that is, that it overrides the ultimate reason that heaven will be heaven because of God's presence. Revelation 22, we read this, the throne of God and the Lamb of God 
will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face. That, what makes heaven paradise? It's God's presence. And David wrote, in his presence is fullness of joy. So the kind, you know, if either of my grandsons or granddaughters run and jump into the arms of their parents or their grandma or their papa, and they, they just, there's this, this sense of unconditional love and joy that they feel. That's a taste of what we're talking about in the presence of God. Unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, accompanied with unconditional overwhelming joy. That is God's plan. So here's a few more things as I was thinking about heaven that I wanted to mention today. Um, the one is, is about hell. And people say, what about hell? Well, what makes hell hell, and hell is a real place, is not so much the fiery fire or the, the flames of fire, but it's the absence of God's presence. I mean, the fact that you live for eternity separated from God, and you live for eternity knowing that the reason you're separated from God is because on, while you're on this earth, you chose to be far from God. And so it just carries out into eternity. Um, it's an unwise choice when you have the option to choose to be far from God on this earth. And it's a very big risk to take as you think about the fact that you are an eternal being. And you'll have a chance in a few moments to make your life right with God so you know you do have a home in heaven. Um, but if, if what makes heaven heaven is God's presence, what makes hell hell is the absence of God's presence. Here's something else. How do you make sure you're in heaven? Now, I don't boldly proclaim who will not be in heaven. That's way above my pay grade. But to know how I can know I will be in heaven, I just refer to the words of Jesus and the words of the people closest to him, like Peter and John and Paul. And Jesus made it clear. God sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's a promise, ironclad. So if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will have a home in heaven. That's it. That's simple. And it's, it's very powerful. But there is no other key to heaven. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Now, once you do that, this is what Paul wrote about followers of Christ, like you and I. He said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment, the split second that your life on this earth ends, you are in heaven. There is no in-between place. There is no such thing as purgatory, no matter what you may have read or heard. There is no in-between place where you have to earn your way into heaven. It's halfway between here. There, this does not exist. The scriptures say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you are absent from the body, you don't get in some long line in front of the gates of heaven. And when you finally get to the front, you get to watch videos of all your mess-ups in life and then try to talk Peter or whoever is at the gate into letting you in anyway. No, that's to be absent from the body. Because you have faith in Christ, immediately... You're in heaven. You're in the presence of God. And so that, that's, that's a slam dunk. And people who preceded you, by the way, um, because there is no time as we know it in heaven, they're not waiting 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to see you. Um, as far as they're concerned, the next time they open their eyes, you're there. So heaven is something you experience the moment your life ends on this earth. Um, but let me comment about something that, um, that comes up from time to time. And that is about rewards in heaven. Because even though your place in heaven is secured by faith in Jesus Christ, period, every Christian will not experience heaven in exactly the same way. Oh, it'll be paradise for everyone. But there will be, I mean, G Jesus was clear, you lay up treasures in heaven, which means you have an opportunity to not lay up treasures in heaven. I mean, you can or you can't. It's up to you when it comes to your generosity. Um, it's, it's true as well. Paul wrote about rewards in heaven, depending on how you live your life. Are you living your life in a greedy and a selfish way? 
And how many of you know that Christians can live a life in a greedy and a selfish way? You can. You have a choice. It doesn't make you not a Christian. It just means you're not acting like one. And so if you live your life as a Christian in a greedy or a selfish way, the rewards you get in heaven are going to be different than the rewards you get in heaven if you live your life in a generous and a selfless way. It's very straightforward. What, what will that be? Well, maybe it's the difference in the, the job you have, the house you live in. Uh, uh, there's any number of things that um, may fall into that. But I think that, I think it should spark every one of us to say, okay, I don't want to just say, because I've had people say to me, well, there's this sin in my life, there's this sin in my life, there's things in my life I just don't want to change, and I don't want to start giving regularly, I don't want to start volunteering, I really don't want to do this, I really don't want to do that, but I don't have to do any of that, I can still get into heaven, I don't care if I just squeak in. Well, why would you even think that way? Faith in Jesus Christ gets you into heaven, period. There's nothing else you can do to earn it. But now that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, make a difference in the world. You know, use your life to mean something. And then you don't only make it into heaven, but when you stand before God, he's saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rewards of your master. And so I think it's an important thing for us to just get a hold of. Heaven is going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, it can be actually even more amazing for you if you use your life on this earth to make a difference for Christ. Here's a final thought. Our lives on earth are meant to be a preview of heaven. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're saying is, wow, heaven is awesome. Can't wait to get there. But may your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven right now. And let me be a part of the answer to that prayer. Do you know, we can, in our lives, preview heaven um, the reality of heaven can dramatically impact our lives right here, right now. The same peace that we'll experience in heaven, we can preview here. The same joy we'll know in heaven, we can preview here. The same presence of God that we'll know in heaven, we can preview here. And so we'll be singing a song in a few moments that says, my desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I open up to you. Throw my fears into the wind, I'm desperate for a touch of heaven. Well, a touch of heaven, well, it, it does vanquish our fears. It can vanquish our fears right here. So here's something to think about. I want to know God's love as a preview for myself in heaven. But here's something also powerful. I want to show God's love as a preview to others of heaven. Does that make sense to you? In other words, we can see a preview of heaven in our own lives, but our life should be a preview of heaven to the people who surround us, to the people who are around us. And um, if we're going to, if we know that heaven is a place of true love and acceptance, then should our lives reflect that love and acceptance to the people around us? Yeah. Yeah. Look at this scripture in Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons who are just like me. Is that what the scripture says? Persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You know, there's something unheavenly about our earthly natural tendency to just be around people like us. And it's natural. I know it. Like if you said to me, you can go out to lunch with a Steelers fan or a Jacksonville Jaguars fan, all things being equal. And I know I'm going to have to hear the Jaguars fan tell me how they kicked us out of the playoffs last year. I'm going to pick the Steelers fan. I naturally want to hang out with people like me. That's not unusual. And yet, when we look into heaven, we see every tribe, every language, people of every nation. And you know what? If your life is an answer to that prayer, may your will be done on earth as is in heaven, then people who are very much unlike you 
will feel the love of God and the acceptance of God from you. Does that make sense? There's people who are completely different than you. Um, it's been on my mind because Jason and I went a couple weeks ago to a two and a half day workshop on fighting um, racism. And it was so interesting to just see the history in our world. And here's the thing, I, I understood that some, uh, in the fallen nature that we have, that some people in the name of power will subjugate others and say, I'm better than you, and so I'm gonna put you under my feet. Some people in the name of greed would do the same thing. They'd say, I'm better than you, so I'm gonna put you under my feet. But what really struck me is how many times in the last 2,000 years that people in the name of Jesus put others under their feet and subjugated them. And they quoted Bible verses while they were carrying out this, complete, this way of living which was completely opposite of what Christianity is all about. Um, I was reading a statement by Frederick Douglass. He was a slave in the Civil, Civil War era. And, you know, we, we talk, I'm, you know, when people say, we have a Christian nation, and I thank God for the roots of our nation and the Christian values and beliefs of so many of our founding fathers. But a lot of things have happened in our country that aren't very Christian. And so he's living in the Christian South. And it was one thing for out of greed and hatred and a desire for power for, uh, for people in the South to be subjugating African Americans to slavery. But at the same time, he was hearing the white pastors use Bible verses to say, this is God's will. Using Bible verses to say, this is God's plan for one kind of person to be above another kind of person. Uh, this is what Frederick Douglass wrote. Between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive the one as pure, good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. And you say, well, that seems so harsh. But I think if you were a slave living in the South in those days, it's not that harsh when people were doing some of those things, at least in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, you know what? I think racism and prejudice, they'll be here till Jesus comes back. But they don't have to be in your life. They don't have to be in my life. They don't have to be in your business. They don't have to be in our church. Because if we're going to reflect Jesus Christ, the whole idea that, well, in heaven, yes, there'll be every race and every tribe and we'll all be together serving God, but here, I'm better than you. Here, I'm different than you, so therefore, I'm going to keep you at arm's length. You know what? That, that just doesn't go along with the whole program. That doesn't go along with what it means to be a, a Christ follower. And I would just challenge you to think, man, is my life a preview of what people are going to see in heaven when it comes to how I treat others who are different than me? And the fact is, when somebody meets Ashley, her life needs to be a preview of heaven. And it can be a preview of heaven when she loves people unconditionally the way we'll find it in heaven. When somebody meets Ryan, will they say, Ryan's life is a preview of heaven because of the way he treats others, the way he accepts people, the way he interacts with people. Don't you want that to be said of you? I love the idea that people would come to Amplify Church and they'd say, there's a lot of messed up people there, but you know what? It's also a little bit of a preview of heaven because of the way they love each other and the way they look out for each other and the way they care about others even who are different than them. And I don't know if we would take it as far as Jags fans, but um, 
But when we interact with the people around us who are different than us, the way we act can be a preview of heaven. And a big part of what makes heaven heaven is that in the presence of God, we will all, we, we will all be one. And we will walk together in that way. Will we be there completely here on this side of heaven? No. But you and I have an awful lot to say about how far in that direction we can go. Can you say amen? amen. So, I don't know, I've heard this phrase. They're so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. But you know what? If you're truly heavenly minded, you will be tremendous, you'll have great earthly good. You'll be able to be really good on this earth, however you want to say it. Because if the reality of heaven hits you, First of all, it starts to alleviate your fears, especially that greatest fear, because the reality of heaven vanquishes the fear of death. But the reality of heaven can impact all of every aspect of your life and cause you to walk in less fear, meaning more life. And when we go, and when we get to the preview of heaven in our lives, that can be very powerful. But when our lives begin to be a preview of heaven to others, that's a total game changer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that you've done in our lives, and we thank you that the only thing we need to do to have a home in this amazing place called heaven is to put our faith in Jesus Christ, your Son. Father, for all of us who have made that choice, we just pray that you would instill in us a greater reality of eternity, a greater reality of heaven, not just to give us comfort over those who have gone before us, but to alleviate our fears, our concerns, and to spark us, to spark us to really make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.